Kicking off our list at number 10, John Lennon, or should I say Jay Lennon, here we go. This one comes from 1966. Now if you're a Beatles fan or a fan of the Lord, you're in for a treat, here we go. You've definitely heard about this scandal, hopefully. During an interview with a UK newspaper, John Lennon started talking about the group and the band and how their popularity was on the rise. Normal band stuff, whatever, from John Lennon. But when Jay Lennon said the Beatles were more popular than Jay Christ, well, people got V upset. He didn't mean anything bad out of it per se, he just noticed that the Christianity charts were on a decline around the world. Meanwhile, the Beatles are selling out left, right, and center. I get what he's trying to say, but yeah, he he definitely messed up here. When a US newspaper printed this exchange months later, Christians were upset, more popular than Jesus. Look, I know what he's trying to say, but still, you can't say that, never. Some radio stations actually stopped playing the band's music altogether. Christians gathered in bonfires to burn albums. Jay Lennon, not Jay Christ, but Jay Lennon, had to apologize numerous times at press conferences. He had to clear everything up just to move on, get some peace, get some forgiveness from the Lord. Number nine, Natalie Wood's death. Natalie Woods was one of the most talented in Hollywood. The actress was in her early 20s and already she was getting Oscar nominations. She's known for West Side Story and Rebel Without a Cause, but when she was 43 years old, Natalie was sailing with her husband, Robert Wagner. They were sailing off Catalina Island in California and she lost her life. Now her death was considered an accident at the time. With very little details, it was classified as an accidental drowning. But come 2013, it was changed. It was changed to drowning and other undetermined factors. Wood, her husband Wagner, and Christopher Walken, yeah, who knew? They were all aboard the 60-foot yacht at the time, November 28th, 1981. The three actors had dinner in the harbor, then returned to the yacht to continue drinking and eating. Wood went missing around midnight, but the new information is that the couple had argued earlier that night. Now this changes things, right? This changes the whole story. And according to a new report, that same report that was changed in 2013, after a different statement was released from the ship's captain, bruises and scratches that were considered fresh were seen on Wood's body. Woods was officially reported missing at one 30 in the morning that night so a lot of questions but I don't know how do you solve that this how many years later number eight the isolator all right a little different but still definitely weird this image may seem haunting at first but it's actually quite ahead of its time the isolator came long before noise canceling headphones or lo-fi beats to study and relax to this goofy looking helmet was intended to block out noise and finally allow you to concentrate on finishing that Victorian era paper due the next day. Now this was back in the early to mid 1900s when inventor Hugh Gernsback worked hours and hours to create this study buddy to block out distractions in life. Now this is a powerful image because the things that distract us today like Instagram, Messenger, dating apps, YouTube, none of those things were even a concept back in 1925 when this device was revealed to the public. So you can only imagine what we need now, right? We need like the ultimate isolator. It's just a motorcycle helmet, it's just Daft Punk's helmet turned off, really. That's all we need. Number seven, Mary Pickford. Now, I mentioned earlier how these celebrity scandals often came from their love life, and then they have to, you know, maybe there's some stuff happening, maybe they were arguing before, that changes the game. Everyone cares about who's dating who and who's divorcing who. I mean, look how often we bring up Pete Davidson today. I mean, how's the guy doing it? Really, how's he doing it? Now, as hard as it is, we can't judge people off a headline or a scandal or whatever we see. We don't know the full story at all, regardless of what it looks like or what we want it to look like. The silent film star divorced her husband husband, Owen Moore, around the 1920s, and then she married a man named Douglas Fairbanks right after. Now, when I say right after, I mean less than a month right after. Like Pete Davidson speed. I'll admit that would interest me as well. I'd have my own opinion. Sure. Now, the public, at first, they weren't happy with Mary Pickford. They made assumptions about how long this affair had been going on. Oh, she was married. How could she? Yada, yada, yada. Her career was actually on the line because of the scandal, and that was until Owen Moore was confirmed to be a... Not so great guy. Turns out throughout their marriage, he was a towards Mary. So she went from being almost canceled with no job to the most courageous for telling her story, how the tides have turned. Number six, portable holding cell. Prisoner transport is always a risky game, right? I have YouTube, I see some stuff that goes on online, it's crazy. When out in public in any way, the odds that something goes wrong or they escape back into the real world and run away, it goes up significantly. The movie Con Air is about this exact situation unfolding. A timeless classic, Nicolas Cage, so good. Dave Chappelle's in that too, wild. Well, back in the 1920s, we didn't have SWAT 
teams move around the worst of the worst. Instead, we had bike cops with cages. It's pretty funny. This portable jail cell is an early version of our modern day police car. The concept was perfect, but the fact that this guy is sitting in a cell and could just grab the officer on the bicycle at any given moment, that's not so ideal. The fact that he's less than a foot away, that's not relaxing at all. Would you ever ride in one of these? I can barely do a sidecar in a motorcycle, let alone pegs on a bike. I don't know. If I'm not riding, I'm not on the bike ever. Number five, the Prohibition era. The Prohibition era was a time where there were restrictions placed on the consumption of alcohol, which of course was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, whatever portation, Asian, and sale of alcohol by the US government, all from 1920 to 1933. Real boring time. Not really. No one listened to it. Of course, this ban certainly didn't stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier, unsafer ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead of, you know, normal drinkable stuff. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that's not widely known is something that the government agencies did to curb the black market sales. They poisoned the industrial alcohol on purpose that was being repurposed for drinking. So. Yeah, some villain stuff right there. Not just poison in a way where the consumer would get sick and maybe not wanna drink it anymore, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this act alone. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials today. I mean, you know, cut to today, everything's legal now it seems, but. There was a time where it wasn't. Number four, not every state. Being a Canadian, at least, we're seeing things become legal all of a sudden, and that's weird. I'm 28 years old, and I'm like, what? This is legal now? Okay, that's weird. It's odd, but we saw this happen in Prohibition as well. Many governors at the time refused to throw away money towards enforcing or policing this alcohol ban. Maryland, for example. Okay, Maryland never even enacted the enforcement code in the first place, and eventually earned a reputation as the most stubborn anti-prohibition state in the union. Nice. New York followed and repealed its measures in 1923 and slowly but surely it all just went away. But some states did the opposite. They were all for the ban. Yeah, nerds. Kansas and Oklahoma remained dry until 1948 and 1958 and Mississippi remained alcohol free until 1966. That's like 33 years after the passage of the 21st amendment. Like. God, can we click refresh? Can we move on? I'm very thirsty, thank you. Number three, the Kensington system. All right, Queen Victoria, let's talk about you a little bit. Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of it before, it's pretty awful. Yeah, I thought I was grounded growing up. This is, whew. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this Kensington system to control her daughter's life. I mean, she literally isolated this child from friends or family members, you name it. Her mother did this all to keep her pure. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every single action, including who she can see or even speak to. Victoria only had two friends growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Theodora of Leningen, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy. Oh, and the Duchess's attendant, Sir John Conroy, well, his daughter, Victoria. Two friends your entire life, that's awesome. I mean, I only had three friends growing up, but two, that's... That's just cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was queen. She literally couldn't walk down the hall to go to the washroom without her mother being by her side. Victoria has reflected on her childhood and she said that she hated John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She actually referred to him as demon incarnate. That's a... Uh a hefty burn from Victoria. Number two, Al Capone's brother. What's going on with that guy during the Prohibition era? What's uh, what's the other side of the family doing this whole time? We don't hear about him. Siblings can be the exact same. My brother and I were the same person pretty much. Al Capone and his brother, they had to separate a little bit. They had to play different paths for a bit. Not homies for a bit, it seems. A little different. Al Capone's oldest brother was a prohibition enforcement agent. Yeah, how ironic is that? Al built a criminal empire built on illegal liquor in Chicago back in the 1920s, but Vincenzo, the eldest of the six Capone brothers, he had changed his name to Richard Joseph Hart, of course, to hide his identity, and after working for a bit in the circus, Vincenzo settled in Homer, Nebraska in 1922, and eventually he was a special officer assigned to investigate bootlegging. Now, after he lost his badge, on suspicion of theft, Vincendo reunited with the Capone family in 1940. He met back up with Al in Miami and started to get in on that family cash that he's been missing out on. And finally, number one, ice mask. Today you can go on Amazon and get a therapeutic gel face mask for like $20. If you're stressed out or trying to avoid puffy eyes, bam, if you're listening to Freezer for a hot minute, and you're set, just like that. You can make your own aloe vera honey gel mask if you feel like. Just click any vlogger that says the word wellness in their bio and well, good luck. Back in the 40s, Hollywood makeup artist Max Factor Jr. created the first ever face mask to reduce facial puffiness. Yeah, what a magician. And it looked 
way cooler too. Again, pun intended. They didn't use freezer gels back then, instead just, well, a bunch of ice cube shaped containers that froze individually on your face. It was an ice cube tray mask, rather. It was actually invented to fight hangovers. That's one of the main reasons. How fun is that? Now, it's a shame that this design never got, you know, caught on because the ones today, they're no good. They're too cute. They're not cold enough or big enough. Imagine busting this mask out during a lecture. Imagine having this underneath the isolator. You could do anything you wanted. You can invent anything you wanted. I don't know, sound off below. Starting our list off at number 10, Lake Neos. We love talking about Pompeii. We can't get enough of it. I'm fascinated. They have a restaurant that's back and open now in Pompeii, it's crazy. Now that's quite the eruption, historically, that's a bad one, that's pretty scary. But a recent eruption in 1986, well, we don't talk about this one enough. First of all, a limnic eruption is a rare event, so you can sleep not in fear tonight. It occurs when CO2 dissolved in deep water lakes suddenly erupts. Cause uh, yeah, that can happen, who knew that? That's why I don't like lakes. There you go, right there. These events have only been observed twice, the deadliest being Lake Neos in 1986. When a limnic eruption occurs, large clouds of CO2 form, which then all of a sudden descend and drop below the oxygen in the air, causing all living things in the vicinity to choke and not survive anymore. In this case, the cloud fell on nearby villages, ultimately causing the deaths of 1,700 people and 3,500 livestock. Number nine, the Spanish flu of 1918. The Spanish flu of 1918. Okay, yeah, this one's probably pretty good. Since we know a little something about plagues now in real life and toilet paper and stress, let's turn the clocks back 95 years when the Spanish flu entered the game. What was it like back then? The Spanish flu, if you didn't know, it was a strain of the H1 N1 virus, which we all know as well. And when it hit, it took 50 to 100 million people. Very fast, 4% of the world's population gone. Now, it was recent and it was quite horrible. We couldn't stay home and watch Ozark for that one, so instead, the Spanish flu is said to have spread so violently because of soldiers being in close quarters during World War I. Yeah, again, very different than our plague. Immune systems were shot as is, and you're telling me a plague rolled through while we're in trenches? No way, what a nightmare. But just like that, the virus disappeared. Better treatment, perhaps it mutated into a much weaker strain, either way, Great, stay gone, get out of here. Go away and stay there, pal. Hit that thumbs up for the Spanish flu not being around. Awesome, we love that. It's a good one to not have. Number eight, the great dying. This name's pretty accurate, if I'm being honest myself. Scariest environment imaginable, here we go. Turning the clocks and solar system back 252 million years ago, the Permian-Triassic extinction, which for convenience sake we'll call the great dying, was and hopefully shall remain the largest extinction event on Earth. The fact that we're even alive right now, watching this video, clicking that thumbs up and subscribing, well, it's all pretty rare, all things considered. This was a butterfly effect triggered by a mass volcanic eruption around the Serbian traps in Russia. A runaway greenhouse effect was responsible for the loss of 95% of all marine life and 70% of all land animals. That's so everything pretty much. Pretty much everything's gone. Temperatures rose as the sea began to absorb large quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. Mentioned that a little earlier and that could not be great. And it began turning into carbonic acid, hence all that marine life that didn't make it. Methane hydrate then started to bubble from the ocean surface which is horrifying to imagine, and it raised the temperature even higher at that point. Now, imagine if this didn't happen. We'd have those scary sharks still swimming around. We're remnants of the surviving 4% of the great dying. Yeah, tell all your friends that. I'm gonna add that to my LinkedIn. That sounds not half bad. Yeah, I survived the great dying, so yeah. Really good at scooping ice cream. Let's do it. Number seven, Maximilien Robespierre. On July 27th, 1794, French revolutionary Maximilien Robespierre and 21 of his followers were all arrested at the Hotel de Ville in Paris. Now, considering that this was 1794 and we got arrested, what follows is sure to be a public nightmare. The next day, Robespierre and again, 21 of his followers were all taken to the Palace de Revolution where they were all executed by guillotine before a cheering crowd Always a cheering crowd, of course. What, are, what else are we doing today? Let's go watch. What history tends to leave out of this part is that Maximilian tempted to take his own life beforehand because he knew his fate was gonna suck with the whole you know, thing. But when he tried to take his own life, he survived and was left instead with a nasty jaw wound. So in Game of Thrones fashion, the executioner, when the time came, ripped the jaw bandage off first and then he saw the guillotine. Yeah, again, to a cheering crowd, remember? They all watch this, all of this unfold. I can't even watch UFC sometimes. You're telling me people watch this? IRL? That's, I'm gonna go throw up real quick, be right back. Number six, 
The eruption. Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines, was another volcanic eruption that shook up history. A little more recent than the other one, this was on June 15th, 1991. Mount Pinatubo, this massive volcano, erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Impressive? Yes. Terrifying? Absolutely. Yep, this is very loud and scary. Activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd, 1991. And these things take a little time to, you know, finish up. So that same year, researchers set up seismographs in the area, and by June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions. And then on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent hot ash 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere, which then rained on down to everything around it, which is the worst thing I can imagine. Additional smaller eruptions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. And that then, on June 15th, the volcano once again went off, this time sending a cloud of ash 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. So, bye bye sun for a little bit. This one's gonna linger. Number five, the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the, well, clearly the very excited Challenger crew right before when they were walking down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. Now, this photo is chilling, but it's nice to see them happy and together. The crew even included, at the time, 37-year-old Kristen McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. You may remember this, but your parents definitely do. See, she had won a spot on the mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space Program. Program. And she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first ever non-military individual in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful just 73 seconds after liftoff. See, two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures that morning, and on live television, the world had to watch as a spacecraft broke apart and then fell into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everybody on board the craft. Now, I'm not sure if you've watched the documentary on Netflix, but it's a mini-series about this whole Thing and it's powerful stuff. It's really emotional, I just finished it and it's moving. Number four, the core. <clears throat> this photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew, and while this photo looks relatively normal and scientific or whatever, a non-threatening photo, what he has in his hands is truly devastating. It changed history. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man. Yeah, that thing. This means that Harold is now holding the nuclear core of the atomic weapon that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast took many many lives, as well as the long-term effects of radiation illnesses. Now, it's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems so perfectly normal when he literally has a life-changing, world-ending device in the palm of his hand, like a literal supervillain holding kryptonite. I couldn't imagine seeing that, let alone holding it. No way. My grandmother wouldn't even hold me as a baby because I was too small and fragile. <laughs> Think she'd hold this? No way. Butterfingers. Butterfingers galore over there. Number three, the ball of burning men. January 28th, 1393, you are formal invited to a masquerade ball. How fun is that? <laughs> Who is it under that mask? Oh, it's just Taylor on Bumblebee. Love him. He's great. The French queen Isabeau of Bavaria is now hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade, right? So bring your finest and longest crocows. Roll it in style. Now, when the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the queen's ladies in waiting, it of course was a big deal. It's fun. It's a big happy day. For some, the best days of their lives. For others at this ball, not so great. Probably the last days of their lives. King Charles Charles VI had five companions perform a dance or a theater routine of sorts. Now they did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bin, right? They had these big, lovely masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were real beasts. Now the party was going well, wine was spilling, people were laughing, beasts were roaring, we were committed, but one rule beforehand was put into place before the party started. Absolutely, positively, no open flames. Obviously, right? I mean, look at that guy. He looks like a couch. We're not gonna put a match near him. It's gonna be chaos. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event, and he forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. He wanted to see everyone. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of said beasts. Either way, this tragic event took the lives of four people, hence the name, Ball of the Burning Men. That's terrible, imagine that, what a gig. Number two, the Stanford Prison Experiment. One of the most well-known experiments of all time was the Stanford Prison Experiment. It was an attempt to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power, and it worked. A little too well, I'd say. Guards and prisoners were all chosen randomly from college students to anyone, your neighbor. You had no idea. Nobody really knew just how bad this experiment would end up, so anyone volunteered. Those in power were taking it to an extreme level. It was absolute psychological 
physical distress. Some of the prisoners went insane. The whole exercise was abandoned after only six days, which is not a short amount of time, but historians say just six days because it was intended to last much longer. Now, it's shocking to see the lengths people go after receiving power over another human being. I thought I was evil unplugging my brother's controller and like playing, you know, and he wasn't plugged in. This is like, Next level. And finally, number one, mummified pets. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below which animals fill your house. We love that. Olivia and I want to get a dog so bad. I was always a dog guy growing up. My aunt had three pugs. It was the dream. I love it. Ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two. We know this. But Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods, which I do too with my shih tzu, of course. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians, so thank you. Egyptians were, of course, fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. But did you know they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and baboons? Yeah, baboons. That's amazing. Go ask your parents for a baboon as a pet. There you go. I thought dogs doing their business inside was annoying, but a lion? Your arm's gonna be tired scooping that one up. Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they had passed, just like how many owners today cremate their pets. I mean, I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Who am I to judge? Other creatures were specially trained to work as helper animals back then. So ancient Egyptian police officers officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling, and then mummify them. What a time, imagine that. Number 10. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Picture this, you're chilling out in your town, somewhere in Spain, then bam, Spanish Inquisition. Except this isn't a comedic gold classic Monty Python skit, but rather the actual thing. And as you'll come to find out, whether you learned it in school or whether you learned it from a plump internet comedian such as myself, it was really messed up. The Catholic Church was about to go on tour, and by that, I mean search out for heresy. Also, maybe take people's land and, and wealth if they were declared an enemy by the Pope, which that's probably a lot of people. And that was a part of it. The Inquisition lasted hundreds of years and saw many people tormented and perishing under the strict codes of religious persecution. Not such a fun time. Number 9. Conversions When faced against religious persecution and the penalty for not following or believing in the same religion as the one that's being enforced could lead you into some hot water, and literally this is a time in history when folks got boiled, or even if you do follow that religion, but not in the way the Pope wants you to do it, could also land you in some trouble. So how do you avoid all these messengers from the Pope who honestly just want to see you hurt? Convert! Simple. Makes sense, right? Just do as the Romans do when in Rome. Except this is my city and they came here to force me into their ways. Oh well, at least they can't hurt me if I convert, right? Well, sadly, no. Folks who converted were untrusted by the Inquisitors as they felt people were only doing it to save their hides and not truly embracing the Lord's light, which is so true, but for the wrong reasons. Yeah, of course they're gonna convert. You boiled Pedro alive in the castle dungeon last week. Did you really think they're not gonna be concerned when you start building a fire in the town square? Hand me a book and some beads, brother. It's time to make the biggest prayer ever. Number eight, give me the loot. No one was really safe from the Spanish Inquisition, and that meant people with money. And if there's one thing the Pope and the Church love more than persecuting against those that they wish, it's a big fat pile of gold. As it goes, if you find yourself being burnt at the stake, there's a good chance that the Pope has his hand in your wallet. After all, you no longer need the gold if you're on the charcoal briquettes of religious righteousness. Nobody is exactly sure how much gold the church was able to appropriate, but if I had to put it in simpler terms for me to understand, the Pope could probably walk into a McDonald's and buy a soda with confidence, even though it's not dollar drink days in the summer. Now that's the kind of wealth that I'm after. Imagine all the chicken nuggets I could get with that. Okay, time to steal. I mean, uh, take gold for that that for sure belongs to me. Number seven, never rat on your friends. As a wise Irish gangster played by a wise Italian-American actor once said, never rat on your friends and keep your mouth shut. In the context of La Cosa Nostra, this is something that will make you just live longer. This is also true for the people of the Spanish Inquisition. When inquisitors showed up to your town, as they were unexpected, they would decree that anyone who relinquishes information on heresy will be relieving of their conscience. Some people would tell the truth of their sins, 
something they would deeply regret moments later. However, more disturbing than that was the snitching. People were encouraged to snitch on their neighbors sinning and heresy. And because a lot of people were guilty until proven innocent, it created a toxic environment to say the least. Basically, any Karen upset with how things are, or if your neighbor keeps his candles lit at night and you can't sleep from the constant light, just tell the Inquisitors and they will throw him in a dungeon and torment the sin out of him. That'll make him think again before buying candles at home sets. Snitches get stitches. Number 6. Napoleon Bonaparte Okay, I called him that because he was a tyrannical dictator who took things too far. However, he did play a part in the Inquisition's ending. Not completely by his doing, but still, interesting. After the French Revolution and all those heads had been removed from bodies, France was on the up and up. It also cashed in on its great military points and earned the great military leader Napoleon Bonaparte. Dude was good at what he did, took on multiple empires at once, and won. It would take a few tries before the Corsican ogre would be toppled in his own game. However, in one of his early conquests, he pushed pretty far into Spain and pretty much took over. He then installed his brother to be in charge. Throwing his French Revolution ideas at everyone in Europe was scary. It's what got him into all that trouble in the first place. But it also scared the church because in Spain, it was kind of starting to work. Eventually, he was defeated and Spain would bring back the Inquisition. Like it never went out of style in the first place. Yikes. Number 5. Alternatives the Inquisition lasted centuries, and in that time, a lot of people got cooked. It wasn't a great time. However, there was an alternative. Sort of. Sometimes the Inquisitors would burn an effigy of the person instead of them. This sounds much better, right? I personally would much prefer voodoo than being the main course of my own barbecue. I know they didn't eat them, I'm just trying to make a burning alive sound a lot funnier than it really was. However, the effigy burning was only really done when someone had passed during the... Uh, brutal torments that were implemented during the super fun time. So e either way, you're not going to make it to dinner. Number four, bad bungee. One method of extracting information from heretics is making them say their last prayers. And they do that by using something called the garuka. A person's arms were tied behind their backs, which were suspended by a rope. Basically, you were just dangling from your arms. It wasn't good. Bad luck. This, more often than not, would dislocate the victim's shoulders or simply just pop them right out of their sockets. Ooh, this one had me singing like a canary. This is just one of the many methods used to get what they wanted. However, it was one of the main methods. Kind of like your go-to, you know? Like your favorite places to eat, your favorite socks, or who you made in Super Smash Brothers. Did I ever think I would be talking about brutal methods of extracting information along with one of Nintendo's best franchises? No, no I didn't. But here I am standing before you as a little math main. Yeah, I know. Number three. The worst of the worst. Diego Rodriguez Lucero was one of the worst of the worst. A prime example of the kind of evils that the Inquisition permitted. The story goes that there was a young woman the Inquisitor fancied, who was already married. Trouble is, well, she was married, but also her parents did not approve of his interest. So, folks at home, I'm going to ask you, what do you think he did? Do you think A, he respected the bounds and the sanctity of a holy matrimony? B, tried his best to swoon and court the young bride? Or C, went home and cried because he couldn't get his way. Go ahead and let us know in the comments what you think. Time's up. If you guess secret answer D, burn her entire family alive and her husband at the stake so she had no choice but to go with him, then you win. Yes. I don't know what you win, but you won. He took her as a mistress and even had a child with her. Oh, now that's romantic. I spoke to the chief, who was also a holy man, and uh, you know what he said? That's not it. Number two, saw it coming. So despite a very charming and classic Monty Python skit, people sort of kind of expected the Spanish Inquisition. They would usually announce ahead of time when they were going to show up, which now that I think about it is kind of ineffective. They would hold mass and interview people, let's say, uh, aggressive interviews. So folks had some time to think about what they were going to say. Now if that was me, I would de-ass the area. However, there may have still been some who did not see it coming, like even some members of the Inquisition who came under scrutiny. Bartolomo de Carranza was imprisoned for 17 years, and he was the Archbishop of Toledo, which in case you didn't know was a super important role for the time. Yeah, no one's safe. Number one persecution. Hey, 
That's what it was all about at the end of the day, wasn't it? While the wealthiest members of the church were gobbling up gold and riches like hungry, hungry hippos coming off of a diet, there were some who just truly believed their light was the only way. Many Jewish and Muslim peoples were persecuted for their beliefs and were interviewed, aggressively interviewed, with some of the worst methods of the time. Sadly, there weren't many places these people could go to escape, as the Inquisition was reaching even some of the Spanish colonies, like in Mexico. And although it didn't spread all the way through Europe, a lot of other places, these people just couldn't go as they weren't really friendly toward these groups. Hey, I can't fix the past, but I just love everybody. I just want you guys to know that, and I'm here to make everyone laugh. You think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful of times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal these all were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality and his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 9 spot today, we have Shoko Asahara, leader of the Om Shinriko cult, this person claimed to be the reincarnation of the Hindu god Shiva. He said that he was destined to lead his followers to salvation once the apocalypse came, but then once he lured in followers, he claimed that he could also teach them to levitate and develop telepathic abilities seems very legit. Apparently, those who were the most skeptical, he allowed them to drink his bath water. No idea why or what this was supposed to be for, and I wish I could unlearn it to be honest, but now we all just have to suffer with that information together. The cult continued to grow and drew in influential and wealthy people, and what did he do? Well, he made a science division of this cult, and this is where they studied the microorganisms living in his bathwater. I'm just kidding, it was actually really messed up. The group went on to attack Tokyo in 1994, which took the lives of seven people. Then, in 1995, they released gas into the Tokyo underground, which led to 12 deaths, 50 injured people, and more than 5,000 people with temporary vision problems. In the end, he and 11 of his disciples ended up being arrested and charged, and they were all sentenced to death in 2004. In our number eight but today we have Victoriano Alvarez. Clipperton Island was an island that is located in the Pacific, and during the 18th and 19th century, everyone was trying to lay claim to it and rule it. I'm talking about Britain, France, Mexico, and of course, our friend Victoriano. He was actually the lighthouse keeper on the island, and in 1910, when Mexico needed to stop sending vital supplies to the island because they were focused on the rising revolution happening there, most of the inhabitants ended up contracting scurvy, which sadly led to their death. In the end, only Victoriano, a small group of soldiers, and about about 12 women and children were left. The soldiers ended up passing away shortly after in an accident, so you know what Mr. Lighthouse did? He threw all but one of the rifles into the sea, loaded the one remaining weapon, and like the worst person he is, he declared himself king of the island. From here, he went on to kill anyone who disagreed with him, and he was also extremely harmful to the women who unfortunately were left on the island. That was, until one badass woman named Tirza Randon simply had enough. She found a hammer and and, well, the rest is history. In our number 7 spot today, we have Richard Nixon. This is perhaps one of the largest scandals and leaks in history, especially in the history of the United States. In the middle of 1972, there were five men who were arrested for breaking into and subsequently trying to bug the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel complex in Washington, D.C. As the year went on, the 1972 presidential election came closer, and there was an anonymous source who fed information to Washington Post reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward that, quote, the Watergate bugging incident stemmed from a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage conducted on behalf of President Nixon's re-election and directed by officials of the White House. Despite this information leak and it being reported in the news, Nixon was still re-elected, but he was also under serious investigation. There were a series of Senate hearings, and the Senate even went on to create a special investigative committee. The hearings were broadcast nationwide, and they had witnesses testifying 
that Nixon had approved plans to cover up administration involvement in the break-in and that there was a voice-activated taping system in the Oval Office. These hearings captured the attention of Americans everywhere for weeks, and in the end the United States Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to release these Oval Office tapes to government investigators, which then went on to reveal that he had not only attempted to cover up what went on, but he also later tried to use federal officials to deflect the investigation. Under the threat of an imminent impeachment, Nixon had no choice but to admit his guilt and resign, making him the only president to do so. His successor, Gerald Ford, ended up pardoning him so he escaped prosecution, but there were 69 other people indicted, with 48 of them later being convicted. Remember that anonymous source who spilled the information in the first place? Well, his identity remained a secret for 33 years until 2005 when former FBI agent Mark Felt revealed himself as the source. This is probably the biggest political scandal in US history and it revealed corruption beyond what Americans at the time could believe. It truly changed the way that people would look at government leaders forever. In our number 6 spot today we have Kurt Gödel. The Austrian American philosopher and mathematician Kurt Gödel lived from 1906 to 1978 and he made quite a name for himself. Being compared to the likes of Aristotle and Einstein, he is best known for his incompleteness theorem, which was a very significant mathematical result. He was obviously very successful and found himself teaching and educating a younger generation, but his personal life is where things got quite dark. When he was just 6 years old, he had a case of rheumatic fever which left him quite ill for the rest of his childhood. This led to him first being pretty preoccupied with his health, and unfortunately this turned into hypochondria which then led him down a path of complete paranoia. He ended up having an irrational fear of getting poisoned, so to avoid this he would only eat food that had been prepared by his wife who also had to taste it beforehand. Sadly, his wife was hospitalized in 1977 for 6 months which obviously left her unable to prepare food for him. Because of the fact that she was unable to do this for him, during this period he refused to eat, which eventually led to him starving to death. In our number 5 spot today we have Albert Fall. Albert Fall was the Secretary of the Interior to former President Warren G. Harding, and while in this position, he decided to secretly allow oil companies to tap into the Teapot Dome Oil Reserve in Wyoming and the Elk Hills Oil Reserve in California. Of course, the reason he did this is because he could make a ton of extra money doing this, like several hundred thousand dollars. This all started to unravel though in 1922 when there was an expose that revealed that the oil had been sold without any sort of competitive bidding. After this expose, Robert La Follette, who was a senator from Wisconsin, created an investigation into the story by the Senate Committee on Public Lands. The Attorney General at the time, Harry Dougherty, began to get some flack for not investigating this alleged corruption, so Harry turned to the FBI director to help him out. The FBI director, William J. Burns, sent an agent to Robert, the senator from Wisconsin's office, to search for anything that could be used to blackmail him into stopping the investigation into the corruption. Despite this seemingly obvious threat, Robert knew that this meant that his investigation was going to reveal something serious, which motivated him to continue on with it. In the end, the shady dealings and all of the bribery was revealed and Albert Fall was officially exposed. This entire ordeal led to him being the first United States cabinet secretary to go to prison. In our number 4 spot today we have Velvely Dickinson. Velvely is a name I've never heard before and I thought it sounded kind of cool and nice until I heard about the person it belonged to. Velvely is one of the reasons why we should never judge a book by its cover. On the outside, she appeared to be like a regular older lady who ran a doll store. Who would think the owner of a doll store would ever be a villain? Okay, maybe everyone. But anyway, as far as I know, everything started out more normal, but once her husband passed away from a heart attack, things took a very sinister twist as she started to take on some interesting side projects for a little extra cash. In 1942, the FBI was able to intercept a letter that was on its way to Buenos Aires. The letter spoke of a quote, wonderful doll hospital and quote, three old English dolls and the FBI was like, hey, that's kind of weird. So their cryptographers went to work and it was uncovered that this letter was actually sent in code. As it turns out, these letters were actually sending military secrets to Japan and some of the information within them would have been extremely valuable if the letter hadn't been intercepted and never delivered. Turns out that Velvely had visited the Japanese Institute in New York, befriended the Consul General and connected with a Japanese naval attache. The FBI arrested Dickinson and upon doing so, they found huge amounts of cash 
Josh along with the instructions for the code she was to use in the letters. She ended up being sentenced to 10 years in prison. In our number 3 spot today we have Monica Witt. Monica is a former United States Air Force technical sergeant as well as defense contractor who has been on the run since 2018. Despite her high ranking position and high security clearance, she is on the run because she defected to Iran in 2013. It is said that from 2013 up until she was found out that she was using her position in order to spy on the United States and relay that information back to the group she was working for. She used different fake Facebook accounts and it is said that the information she gave included the classified true name and counterintelligence activities of a US intelligence operative. This is of course a problem regardless of how important this operative was, but it is said that this information she shared had the potential to cause serious damage to United States national security. It truly is an absolutely wild story and Monica is still out there on the run hiding from the consequences of her betrayal and espionage. In our number 2 spot today we have Irene of Athens. Taking it back to the Byzantine Empire, Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI and while the pair co-ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory though. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep, that's how good old Mumsy came into power. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Boy Jones. Okay, I've heard of people being called Boy Jones before, but little did I know Boy Jones was a very real and very creepy person. His full name was Edward Jones, and this little rascal basically stalked the Queen from 1838 to 1841. He managed to break into Buckingham Palace, and we aren't just talking about once, we are talking about many many times. He knew exactly where to go and what to do, and once in the castle, well, he would hide under the queen's sofa, he would sit on her throne, and worst of all, he would go through her clothing. Like a little creep. He even went as far as to steal her clothes, which is just stupid, of course. Taking evidence of your crimes is bad practice. Thankfully, he did finally get caught, but man, a few years of sneaking in and sitting on the throne. That's crazy. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure, then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe. I don't know. It's kind of horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames? Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames names were a little bit different. They were descriptions almost about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. 
Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pot. Nice, here you go, for you and yours. Enjoy, Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no, but they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table, you're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. So it was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified. And once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise. Hard to get out of your mind. Radio carbon and tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I look at our producer Chris, I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly. It was far too cold for them to even stand a chance. And it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? 
No. Number two, Plague Bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My god, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now, bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers? Show of hands. Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johann, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe. And with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table, boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot. Like a lot, a lot. Number 10, watch party. Marriage. Nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the Middle Ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit, and one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly, no. Instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love. It was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view, but I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia. A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice, just like his Gotham counterpart? No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number eight. Red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village, or even from two different opposing villages, and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but 
Well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse. Or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. What? Don't even ask. What? Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red. Black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, who, who thought? Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy, but I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. And the next guy who became pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War, what is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I'm gonna do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two maybe, we'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical, we'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with loaded supplies, which meant sometimes armies pissed Village. Mm hmm yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is gonna cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back, like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number three, criminal cook-off. Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice. Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number two, Pope Not-So-Innocent the Third. 
Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about Pope so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now, that didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simone de Montfort said, destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes, they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. Disgusting. Number 10, D-Day, laying lots of pipe. D-Day was the day that the Allies had been preparing for for so many years. June 6, 1944 was the beginning of the end for fascist tyranny in Europe. Composed of landing spots in Normandy, France, were Utah, Omaha, Juno, that's ours, gold and sword. The idea was to finally punch through the mustache man's Atlantic wall and get a foothold in occupied Europe. Thousands of lives were lost in a matter of hours. Crazy battle. However, something I think is very interesting and a battle that no one really talks about is the logistics battle of D-Day. Seriously, the amount of stuff that had to happen or to be put in place in order for the invasion to commence was insane. One example of this is the pipeline that would fuel allied vehicles once the invasion had been successful. Starting in 1942, the pipe was being laid. Eventually, it would extend over a hundred miles into France and Europe to supply the war effort. Crazy what we'll do for a little gas. Number nine, Battle of Zappolino. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino was a large scale event over a bucket, like a pail, like a literal wooden, I'm not even joking here. The War of the Oaken Bucket, that's what it's also referred to as. This war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina, they all went head to head and it kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal, steal the town's wooden bucket from the city's well. How horrible is that? I mean, resources were pretty sparse back then, so this was actually like a really big deal to do that. The Bolognese declared war immediately and sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Medina had a smaller army. They had only 500 infantrymen and 2,000 cavalry forces. Thing is, these guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Some recalled them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city. They came back like, oh, you want this bucket, eh? And they started smacking it with spoons and they just left again. The bucket is currently and still on display in Medina. If you want to go see it, go take a look. That took so many lives. That many people kicked the bucket over this bucket. History is strange. Number eight, Operation Cottage. If you heard the title Operation Cottage and thought that maybe Canadians were involved in the process, then you would be correct. Unfortunately, this was a battle between Canadians and Americans during WW2. Back in 1942, Imperial Japanese Marines had landed a force in Alaska at Kisika Island. That alone was terrifying. You know, they were so close. America and Canada finding out about this were naturally alarmed. So in 1943, they sent some men to take care of the issue. When the Allies landed, a firefight ensued. Naturally, it's WW2, it happens. And both Canadians and Americans had casualties. The trouble is, it wasn't the Japanese. They had abandoned their post a few weeks earlier, as they deemed it was too difficult to defend, and it's Alaska, it's too cold. Anyone from that area could tell you the same. As it turns out, it was Americans and Canadians firing upon each other in a case of mistaken identity, or not so friendly fire. Number seven, Combat of the 30. Also known as Combat des Trants, you can say that if, you, if you're feeling fancy, of course, but the Combat of the 30, easier for me to say, took place during the Breton War of Succession. This was back in 1351. This battle was arranged beforehand, you know, bring your shiniest armor and your most golden gal and meet me at the battlefield at Brittany. 
threw a little note in. And then both sides had 30 champions. They had their best knights come forth in all the land and they just fought it out. One side represents the King of England, the other the King of France. This whole thing was arranged by one guy, a captain in the French banner named Jean de Bonmagnor. This event pulled in a crowd. Drinks were literally served throughout the audience. This fight lasted a very long time. Hours went by and four French knights had fallen as well as two Englishmen. So they started taking breaks. Yeah, like a common sporting event now. By the end of the whole thing, the English surrendered after losing nine knights and the French in total lost six. And nobody tipped the servers. All bad. Number six, the battle for Castle Itter. Wehrmacht versus SS. May 5th, 1945 was the final act of WW2, or really, the last few days in Europe. So, when American soldiers came across a Wehrmacht detachment defending an Austrian castle full of high value targets from some other Germans who hadn't seen the big picture yet, yeah, it, it was gonna be crazy. So the Americans joined forces with these renegade Germans to help defend the castle. I'm gonna call in Hollywood again here. Come on guys, this one just writes itself. The ensuing battle was very hectic as ammo was running dry and becoming something of a nail biter. When finally reinforcements showed up to rescue the Motley crew. What made Germans turn against Germans? Was it five years of WW2? Maybe it was hunger, grief, or maybe they were just fed up with mustache man. Either way, it makes for a great story and shows that not everyone is terrible. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Number five, the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course, we have to mention one of the most unspeakable battles of all time, the Battle of LA, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid. It happened during World War II at the end of February 1942. This event, first of all, took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack, so everybody was obviously immensely stressed out. Something like 25 enemy aircraft was spotted flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th, so air raids went off. Blackouts were now in effect. This was not a drill, right? Or was it? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells, in total around 1,400 shells were blasted off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people in total died from this retaliation, and it was indeed a false alarm. A press conference was held by Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah, just nerves. Ha, whoopsies, thought I heard a noise. Oops, sorry, sorry about your heart attacks. Number four, the Emu War. Australia, a land of beautiful landscapes, sunshine, and an accent that I'm trying to master. It's, it's not that easy. All crocodile hunters aside, they are infamous for a battle of biblical proportions, something that was so huge and magnificent, it for sure had to be talked about. It's the emu war. Yes, that's right, the Aussies went to war with emus, and they lost. Okay, hold on. Before I get blooming onions thrown at me, let me explain. Basically, the Great Depression was hard for Australia. It was hard for everybody, but especially them. It was rough. Even rougher was emus destroying their crops. Really bad. So bad, the farmers called upon the government, who then called upon the army, who then called upon a couple of dudes with a truck and a machine gun to, to, to deal with it. Trouble is, they were just too darn good at dodging gunfire. The emus, that is. One politician jokingly said, the emus should be given medals for their bravery. I, I don't even know about that one. I don't even know. That's just, okay, they missed. I guess they missed. Number three, the War of Jenkins' Ear. Not to be confused with the War of Holyfield's Ear, that was a bit more recent. The Jenkins' Ear War took place in 1731, when a British trader, Robert Jenkins, was accused by Spanish authorities of being a smuggler. Reminder, this is 1731, so everybody was like, Okay, you said it, therefore, must be the truth. And so they seized all his belongings, and to make matters somehow worse, they cut off his ear. Now cut to, eight years later, the British are now brainstorming, just looking for a reason to attack Spain and then, you know, force them out of the Caribbean. So they launched this big attack and over 25,000 lost their lives. Disease was to blame for most of that body count, so if you're gonna avenge your ear, wash your hands. In the meantime, I don't know, just, just an idea. Number two, Navy cheese. I can't lie to you guys, there's a part of me that would love to get into a time machine and join the Royal Navy in its prime. Sailing the sea for her royal majesty and getting into naval battles. Just like you see in the movies. Or me, Pirate Captain Chetty, imagine that. Would also be pretty sick, and, and Captain Chetty and maybe, maybe Helmsman McWaters. It's all fun and games until wheels of cheese start causing mortal wounds. Wait, what, what did I just say? Yeah, during a naval skirmish between Brazil and Uruguay, things were getting a little out of hand. Brazil, having the superior navy, wasn't worried. Who cares? And besides, the enemy had just run out of cannonballs. What could they do to us? 
Before they could bust out the champagne and celebrate, however, the Uruguay ship fired back with wheels of cheese. And it worked very well. It destroyed a lot more than the Brazilian ship would like to admit, and was forced to retreat. Getting destroyed by cheese is not going to look good on the report. And finally, number one, the Battle of the Stray Dog. I grew up with dogs my entire life. I love dogs, but it's stressful at times. You open the door to look at a mailman for a split second, and all of a sudden your furry friend is running down the street after a blue jay. It's not easy. Now I'm running in my socks at 9 a.m. It's no good for anyone. Since the Second Balkan War in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head. A lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions are high. Come October 1925, things escalated and poof, exploded. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly, as dogs do, but in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria, so he was shot at. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria, and so began a full-on war. By the time the International Committee negotiated a ceasefire to, you know, clear up the obvious misunderstanding that happened here, 50 people had already lost their lives. So, keep those leashes on, folks. That's all I'm saying. Number 10, the Cold War. Some of our viewers may have lived through the times classified as the Cold War, but let me clarify for anyone who doesn't know or was too deep into hippie culture to remember what the heck was going on. And honestly, it's pretty messed up. So, in a nutshell, after World War II ended, Germany was split into two. One side, capitalist allies, the other, communist Soviet Union. Russia was an ally during World War II, but this relationship quickly deteriorated. The two political and economic ideologies would grow distaste for one another, and would compete politically, economically, and most fearfully, with their militaries. The United States being the superpower on the one side, and the Soviet Union on the other. They spread their views, a lot of times by force, until almost the entire world was divided by the two styles of government, lasting from 1945 all the way up until MTV was still good, around the mid-90s when the Soviet Union was dissolved. That's a lot of history to unpack here, so I'm gonna do my best to tell you some crazy facts and to make you laugh. I'm a comedian, it's what I do. Number nine, Charlie in the Trees. We've talked about Vietnam a few times on this channel, but I can't stress this enough. It was messed up for many people, Americans and Vietnamese alike. As a Canadian, we mostly dodged that hairy situation. While the Vietnam War was America's worst war since World War II, and the most costly in terms of lives and budget, it was not the only conflict. Vietnam was probably the hottest war of the Cold War, but there's many other little things that make this such an interesting time. France had spent years trying to reclaim their colony, and with no luck, America being there for a total legit reason of containment also didn't have much luck, especially after 1968. Refer to our Vietnamese war videos, they're pretty good. Lives lost, lessons learned, and hopefully somebody found Charlie. I swear, in every movie they're always looking for a guy named Charlie. I guess we never find him, I don't know. Number 8, the name's Bond, James Bond. It would be difficult to talk about the Cold War without talking about espionage and spies. While not to the exaggerated level the 007 series likes to take things with its, well, little people and lethal hat throwing, there was still, however, a ton of black ops going on behind the scenes. You only have to look at the superpower spy agencies, the CIA and the KGB. Both agencies went on globe-trotting clandestine operations to gather information, sabotage, and just about anything else James Bond would do. Stealth, spy gadgets, and missions to save the world. All martini shaken, of course, not stirred. Just like Bond, except the whole womanizing thing. Or maybe there was, as the Soviets would often use women's alluring good looks to produce results they so wished for. Ah yes, thanks to beautiful female agents sleeping a lot, uh, thank you. We now know we are one step closer to discovering the Colonel's secret herbs and spices. Our chicken shall have flavor soon. Number seven, Fallout. Probably the heaviest underlying theme of the Cold War was the constant and looming threat of nuclear annihilation. The US got smart in the end of 1945 and developed and used the world's first atomic bombs. This was great for America, not so great for Japan. America was feeling mighty high. That was until the Soviet Union developed their own shortly after. Now it wasn't so cool anymore. Both sides were worried that further escalation of any issue in the Cold War would lead to mutually assured destruction, rendering the bombs the most destructive weapon on Earth and also the most useless. And to be fair, there was a good chance of that happening. There were multiple instances of escalation where the world watched on as the two superpowers were about to end it all. Finna act up because they wanted their politics to be number one. I'm an act up. Number six, space race. 
No, the space race is not a race on how many special brownies that you can eat and see how fast it takes you to space out. Remember grade 10, right? I know. What it actually was, was a race to see who could develop the best and fastest space age technology and advancements. Which, if you study economics, could be a good thing. Healthy competition driven by new technology. In reality, it kinda sucked though. In the 1950s, Russia launched the first satellite, the Sputnik. Which to America was scary because it's America. We never lost anything. The Soviet Union would follow up with the first animal in space and then the first man. Some experiments unfortunately never made it back in one piece. America then trumped them back by landing on the moon. Now what's so messed up? Well, for the Soviet Union, this began to put a severe dent in their economy. All the spending on space and military was having an effect on their people. In a nutshell, it made them broke. And if you want to figure out what style of government is better, well, the US has Las Vegas, Russia has beets, and turnips, and depressed artists. Number five, the Korean War. A war that is frankly just not talked about enough, and sadly, I feel like the veterans don't get enough praise, so thank you. Now, back to the mildly funny content. Korea was finding itself in quite a pickle. The same pickle that 40 other nations throughout the Cold War would find themselves in. Capitalism and communism were going to have a fight. A fight in their backyard. And it was going to be costly. Both sides supported their own not so nice dictator and a bloody conflict ensued. Despite the UN and US efforts and despite the Chinese and Soviet efforts, things kinda ended in the worst stalemate ever. As even today the tensions exist, Korea remains split in two by the ideologies. And North Korea is still a little crazy. Just a little bit. Number four, up, up and away. Back when history's second favorite mustache man, Sosef Jolin, was in charge, things were kind of oppressive. They were just really oppressive, actually. It, it, it was bad. Where were the Karens when we needed them to stand up to the actual oppression? When Germany was split into cool and not so cool Germany, the division between its citizens was becoming clear. And the people on the capitalist side were just living better. As life is better when you can walk into a German 7-Eleven and purchase a Slim Jim, cigarettes, Mountain Dew, and a reputable magazine with lewd centerfolds. You know the one. So Mustache Man feeling confident after getting rid of history's favorite Mustache Man blocked roads and trains from Berlin in hopes that the West would give in to his demands. And in pure teenage defiance, the West began to fly in supplies daily. 12,000 tons of goods daily. That's a lot of centerfolds, my guy. Number three, the man who saved the world. Vasily Arkhipov, not a name I reckon my humble bumblebees are familiar with. Well, why is this man so important? He's one of the reasons why you're not watching this video from the comfort of a concrete bunker. During the totally non-controversial Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a Russian submarine with a Russian submarine commander. All of Sean Connery jokes aside, the sub had nuclear capabilities. What's even scarier than that is due to some rising tensions and miscommunication, the bane of every good relationship, three out of four keys had been turned and were waiting on Vasily's response. Those were keys to launch nukes, by the way. Maybe it was his bleeding Russian heart, or a strong will to save mankind. Or it could have been nuclear radiation warping his brain and body due to a previous mishap on the sub. But regardless, he said nay, and the nuclear war was avoided. Thank goodness. I hope that never happens again. Whew. Number two, Broken Arrow. What is scarier than the uncertain destruction of society as we know it? And trust me, nuclear fire would be a bad way to go. I don't want to grow another third arm. The first one was difficult to get rid of. Well, how about not knowing at all where the bombs are? Sure, you wouldn't really see one until there was a mushroom cloud over your favorite vegan restaurant, and by then it would just be too late. But what I'm talking about is devices that got lost in the mail, or just lost by the military. And yes, it's happened multiple times through the decades. One incident where a device was lost from a crash plane, and three out of the four safeties had been failed. That's a little too close for comfort. But of the declassified incidents the US is willing to tell you about, the Soviet Union has never said how many they lost. Just one of those comforting facts to keep both sides of your pillow warm at night. Number one, happy ending. There were tons of things to talk about during the Cold War. Seriously, you need a historian and a few textbooks to break everything down. However, when you boil down the main events, what was it really for? All that tension and stress. Nuclear war is just on the horizon. Years of arms racing and flinging people into the atmosphere faster than you can say, look out Ukraine. A lot of things changed and a lot didn't. 
To me, it just seems like it's such a waste of money and time to have all those world enders collecting dust somewhere under an onion shaped building. Russia has some onion shaped buildings. I, I'm just assuming that's that's where they are. I'm hungry at this point. The point I'm making is let's keep the nuking to the fat man and fall out the video game. Not real life. Let's just be peaceful. Number 10 third party involvement. You'd be forgiven if you thought the Vietnam War was a really bad war between the United States and Vietnam. Literally every book, movie, or depiction of the late 60s conflict is GIs in green walking through the jungle brush as Huey helicopters buzz over the tree canopies. Chaos surrounding as a Rolling Stones or other influential song from the era plays in the background. The camera pans out to show how thick the jungle is as the soldiers are always looking for someone named Charlie. Wonder if they found him. Forrest Gump jokes aside, good movie, go see it. Yes, that is the Vietnam War for the US, but there were actually a few other countries involved. More than you might think. The Soviet Union and China were 100% supporting. Vietnamese communists, the French years prior were trying to claim back an old colony, and Australia also sent soldiers to support the effort. And perhaps most strangely, South Korea sent soldiers to aid South Vietnam, so the same thing didn't happen to them. It's just a crazy mix, isn't it? Number 9. Are you done? If you ever find yourself getting captured by spooky, scary communists, maybe you should remember Doug Hegdal, a sailor who was blown overboard by a ship gun and washed ashore to probably the worst shore to wash up on in the 1960s. Maybe that or a nude beach full of hippies, I digress. Doug eventually found himself in a super friendly POW camp. Doug knew he was going to be in some trouble, and if he didn't think fast, was going to be subjected to torment that isn't appropriate for any YouTube or TV show on air. So what did Doug do? A daring escape, you say? Eliminated all his enemies from the stealth that only a cardboard box could provide? Hang upside down with tri light night vision goggles and wait for guards to walk by? No, my stealth gaming friends, he played dumb. Very dumb. In order to convince the enemy that he wasn't worth very much, so that in theory they would let him go. Not convinced, the Viet Cong tried to get Doug to spew propaganda. Doug made a five head play and pretended he couldn't read. He pretended to be three head. After many efforts, the Viet Cong declared him the incredibly stupid one. He was eventually released back to the US where he gave some intel on the Viet Cong that he remembered over his time locked up, which he remembered to, to the tune of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. Doesn't get any more American than that. Oh, McDonald had a farm. Yeah, okay, anyway. Number eight, 360 all scope. Remember the days of Modern Warfare 2? Remember hitting those early spawn shots on high rise with the intervention? Yes, me too. Times have changed, and although the days of waking up early on Saturday morning to rip a little Call of Duty while well, your parents fight in the next room may be gone for me, they are not forgotten. I wasn't the best sniper out there, but I could hit a shot or two. However, no energy drink fueled YY ladder stall compares to the white feather. Meet Carlos Hathcock, a sharpshooter from the Vietnam War whose accuracy would have Robin Hood questioning his bowstrings. He is credited with taking down a lot of enemies from a quite a staggering distance away. However, his biggest claim to fame would be his Robin Hood splitting arrow moment. One day in the Vietnam jungle, he spotted an enemy sniper and terminated the threat. The thing is that Hathcock's bullet went through the enemy scope and ended his sniping career. That's one heck of a shot. Mom, get the camera! Number seven, tall courage. Richard Flaherty was unusual to most US soldiers deployed in Vietnam at the time. He was a short king, measuring in just short of five feet, which was the US requirement for soldiers at the time. His training proved that while he was short, he was just as effective as the other soldiers. Nicknamed the Mighty Mouse and the Giant Killer when in the field, his courage and efforts would see him join the famous 101st Airborne where he was sent on search and destroy missions in the thick jungle brush. His efforts would eventually earn him a silver star and would wind up in the very tough yet mysterious Green Berets. Never judge a book by its cover. Number six. Yeah, of course I am the American. Larry Thorne was a soldier and a great leader for US forces training civilians in Vietnam. Distinguished with medals and wasn't afraid to get dirty. He helped defend a base from a Vietnamese attack, and if he wasn't there, it most likely would have gone foobar. However, that's not what's so messed up about Mr. Thorne. Larry was hiding something, something rather interesting. Being a little bit older, it made sense he had been in the military for a while. However, it wasn't the US Army. Larry had fought in two other armies previously. The Finland Army, which was his home against the Soviets in the Winter War, and more disturbingly, fought with the German Waffen SS. Yeah, I am an American and I have no prior actions that would cause you to have any suspicion. Yeah, 
Sadly for the man with all that experience, he perished in a helicopter crash in 1965. His body was recovered years later. It was given to full military honors when buried. You never know who you're standing beside. Number five, welcome to the suck. Meet Roy Benavidez, a soldier with so much courage and bravery, I don't even have a joke for it. A man who after being severely injured and told he was never going to walk again, walked out of the hospital six months later. He then joined the very tough and elite Green Berets, where he went on a mission and was stuck in hell for six hours. A group of Green Berets, including himself, had been pinned down by enemy fire and it wasn't looking too good. Most of the group, unfortunately, was severely injured or simply just not living anymore. Roy himself had sustained bullet wounds and had been stabbed by an enemy bayonet. He eventually made it out barely alive, and when the doctors got to him, they said he wouldn't make it. So with his last breath of life, he spat in the doctor's face to show he was still somehow holding on. When you look at the full story, it's crazy. It's so messed up. I left a lot of the gruesome details out, but definitely check that one out. Number four, hideouts. Officials say the Vietnam War officially ended in 1975. Officially. However, for many, there was much fighting to do. For black Americans, the civil rights movement may have changed things, but there was still a long way to go. Vietnam had a communist utopia to unite and build, and many people simply had to recover from the casualties of war, injuries both physical and mental. However, for one father and son duo, this fighting lasted decades, literally. Ho Van Tan ran into the jungle with his one-year-old son in 1972 after his village was destroyed by American bombs in Operation Rolling Thunder. Fearful that it would be the end of him and his family, he hid from the war. He hid for 40 years and wouldn't come out of hiding until 2013, when he was in his 80s and his son was in his 40s. The men were frail, malnourished, and had severely rotten teeth. Can you imagine what it would be like to live without any technology for 40 years and then to come out of the jungle and find smartphones everywhere? It's just such a polarizing idea. Messed up, man. Messed up. Number three, high times in Vietnam, man. Peter Lemon was one of many soldiers in Vietnam whose efforts defending a US base with a machine gun and his bare hands earned him a medal of honor. Thing is, Peter Lemon wasn't a Yankee. He was a Canuck, born in Toronto. Becoming a Patriot American and joining the war was part of his dream for some reason. What's so messed up about Peter, you ask? It's not about being Canadian in the American Army and really just doing very well. We're cool, I promise. But rather, it's his illusions of him fighting the war that quickly deteriorated. If you were around in the 60s and 70s, you probably took part in a little thing called grass. To say it was everywhere was an understatement, but I mean, hey, these guys were at war. They needed a break. His defense of the US base, while under the influence of the devil's lettuce, is where this point is getting to. Number two, save the trees, man. Like I've mentioned before, the jungles of Vietnam were just as much as an enemy for the US soldiers as the communists were. Agent Orange was used to help unjungle the jungle, but it wasn't instant working and it took a few days to really kick in. Bulldozers were sent in after to help remove the trees. This for the US wasn't fast enough and they needed a better answer. So it was time to militarize some serious logging equipment. A 97 ton tree crusher that made trees 50 feet tall crumble like saplings. However, the machine was prone to breaking down and did get stuck in the mud. And in case you didn't know, towing a 97 ton vehicle out of the mud while being fired upon is not easy. No thank you, I'll pass. Number one, actually Apocalypse Now. Yes, the movie, go watch the movie, the original, not the Redux, you can, you can skip the Redux. While based on the book Heart of Darkness, the movie is based around the Vietnam War, but if you ask me, it does a better job of getting the themes across in a more digestible setting. You can take the movie in many different ways, but even at face value as a movie, in the Vietnam War, it's insane. It does a great job of showing the horrors of war, the insanity, PTSD, hypocrisy, and the gore that was the Vietnam War. A war that would leave America slightly embarrassed, as this was a time of great change all over the world. Couldn't recommend it enough though, seriously, go watch it. Number 10, not till the fat lady sings. Most people would be delighted to know that a war is over. War sucks, it's expensive, costs lives, and uh, come on man, it just sucks. Officially, North and South Korea have not signed a peace treaty. That's right. Although they both agreed to an armistice in 1953, on solid paper, there's no surrender, which technically means they're still at war. This sounds bad, but it can't be, right? Not as if tensions between these two could ever be high. It's not as if they're scheming of ways to undermine each other and just waiting for an excuse to open the biggest can of whoop ass at a minute's notice, right? Everything's fine. I don't know if everything's fine. Number nine, up and down. The Korean War was a great military success and everyone went home happy. Very nice, great success. 
Uh, just kidding, actually. It didn't really solve anything. What's so messed up is everyone just kind of ended up where they started. North Korea had pushed into the south, almost making it all the way south, when the very effective UN organized a police force of multiple nations mostly US, and punch their way back up to the 38th parallel. But maybe we better go further, ballsy General MacArthur Douglas said to himself, admiring his own reflection in the mirror, pushing their way all the way up to the Chinese border, where 250,000 Chinese soldiers helped the UN force by pushing them back down to the 38th parallel, putting everyone in the same position they were in the beginning. It's almost as if war was the pointless cost of life. Nah, that can't be right, no. Number 8. Nuclear Threequel This one is kind of scary, honestly. So, during the Korean War's impression of snakes and ladders, game of borders, and front lines changing like the wind, General MacArthur was getting frustrated with the progress, or lack thereof. He wanted a quick solution. Something that would bring a swift end to the conflict, all while flexing a little muscle in the process. Being a big fan of how the US annihilated two cities in Japan in the previous war, he proposed that America once again just start dropping nukes fallout style. While this was being considered, it was ultimately a no cal zone situation, as I like to call it, for the US and the UN. Soviet Russia had just figured out the recipe for nuclear bombs and would not hesitate to send one their way in return. The US had lost its nuclear monopoly and ushered in the age of mutually assured destruction. And thank god they didn't to be honest. I love playing the Fallout games, but that doesn't mean I actually want to be in them. Nah thanks man, I, I'm good. I'm good dude. Number 7. I need a hero. When we all tell stories, we like to tell stories with heroes and villains, beginnings, middles, ends, rising actions, climax, and conclusion. Bad guy hurts good guy, good guy perseveres, and he beats bad guy. Credits roll as the hero walks off into the sunset. Now I'd like to tell you that the Korean War was a tale of good versus evil. But it's more like bad versus evil. Korea was split between Communist North, supported by China and the Soviet Union. The South was supported by the UN and the US. Each has their own dictator, wanting to unify Korea in their own image. Yes, the Communists were not very nice, but the right wing dictator installed by the US was arguably just as bad. So in short, a super awesome time to be in Korea. Number 6. Tootsie Slide this one goes out to all the fans of MacGyver, you're gonna love this one. So during a very cold segment of the Korean War known as the Chosen Mountain, nicknamed Frozen Chosen by the very cold marines that were stationed there, temperatures were below negative 25 degrees celsius and morale was lower, well actually their ammo count was. So the marines radioed in an airdrop for Tootsie Rolls, which was just a code name they'd given to mortar shells. Apparently the radio operator receiving this message did not understand this. And the actual chocolate candy Tootsie Roll was airdropped to the Marines instead. Yeah. Not wanting to waste this processed American delicacy, Americans went full MacGyver and discovered that once chewed and placed in bullet holes or in things that needed to be filled, the treat made for a decent enough repair. If women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. Number 5. Stranger Danger We all know if there's a van that rolls up to your neighborhood and there's a man inside offering free candy, it's gonna be a bad time. Well, North Korea might have had the biggest and baddest van in the neighborhood, as it's estimated that 84,000 people were kidnapped during the war. That is so many people. Why was North Korea putting so many faces on the side of milk cartons, you ask? Well, it was mainly a force repopulation tactic, which again is so messed up, I can't even begin to tell you how wrong that is, but also may have been the beginning of a super secret spy program, where North Korea was interested in having biracial spies, making it easier to infiltrate the enemy. Just one of many nefarious activities North Korea has been up to. There is no spy program in North Korea and I, I am not saying, I, I am absolutely saying this of my own free will. Please do not send help. Number 4. Not actually a war. While there were a lot of bang bang shooty shooty killy killy during the Korean war, technically it wasn't really a war even though it feels like one. Being referred to as a police matter, yeah, the US sent a lot of troops to fight this not war, which in case you're wondering how that's possible, you can take a look at Congress, as Congress never declared war. 
setting a new precedent. Although, after the millions of dollars spent, the loss of thousands of soldiers on each side, plus the UN force being comprised of 16 other nations. I'm not exactly sure how it's not a war. That's like me saying, I did not do my English essay because it's not an English essay. It's a two page opinionated piece that should be four pages, but I didn't read the book and just use cliff notes. Sorry Mrs. M. I mean, come on, can you blame me? Have you ever actually tried to sit down and read Lord of the Flies? Not in a school setting? I called the chief last night, you know what? He said it wasn't it. Number three, Top Gun. Ask any military history guru or anyone who's got a thing for it and they will tell you that after World War II, military tech was about to get a little crazy. On September 8, 1950, something a little spicy happened in regards to both military and aviation history. The world's first all-jet dogfight took place. Americans in F-80s and communists piloting the infamous MiG. Despite a movie that I actually think isn't very good, this wasn't great for the Americans. Yes, they did end up shooting down the enemy, but it was clear that the MiG was outperforming the F-80. Forced American aviation to come up with something just a little bit better. Come on guys, you can do it. Number two, just in case. So it's been years since the Korean War. They've been split in half, DMZ is there, everything's kosher, right? Well, not exactly. If you follow the news in recent years, you know that North Korea has been doing some unsavory testing with ballistic missiles. However, what some people may not know, and it's kind of messed up when you think about it, is to this day there is still a large number of US soldiers stationed in South Korea, 30,000 to be exact. A remnant from the Korean War, but something that many would consider to be a necessity given the hostile nature of the North Korean regime. Hopefully things stay in a stalemate and don't escalate. We got enough problems on our hands right now. On a side note, there's also a large concentration of US soldiers in Japan as well. Not directly related to the Korean War, but they are in close proximity just in case uh, anything sneaky happens. Okay. Number one, big boom, little changes. World War I changed lives. It dissolved century old empires, completely redrew the map. World War II doesn't happen without World War I, and it was so bad, the whole world swore to never let that happen again. Heck, even wars from centuries ago had more cause and effect. The Korean War is very different in this regard. Like previously mentioned, the communists were bad, but the capitalists were not much better. While the lines may not be as blurred as some wars, the outcome was completely different to what most people were used to. When World War II ended, there was cheering in the streets. When the Korean War ended, there just wasn't much to show for it, besides a tragic loss of life, debt, and a new theory about communism that would literally make the exact same thing happen in Vietnam 15 years later. Seriously, the comparisons are uncanny. It's like the exact same thing.